Professor Uli Hebi, uh, Professor Emeritus of Structural Biology at um, um, Bar um, Bizar Centrum Basel and Director of the Mueller Institute for Structural Biology also in Basel. The title of his presentation is Self-Assembling Peptides Nanoparticles, Their Use in Biological Application. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice introduction. I have to really apologize. I'm not Dr. Uli Abbey. I'm yeah. Dr. Peter Burkhardt. But Uli Abbey is a very good friend of mine, and he is unfortunately not able to attend the conference, so he asked me to jump in. And we are actually very uh, well uh, complementary. He has a beard but no m mustache. I have a mustache and he, uh, no, no beard. So the title of the talk, though, is exactly the same. And we have been working on this topic for many, many years together. So I'm pretty confident that I can give you a talk that is pretty much what he would have been given. So. As, as you see, I will be talking about self-assembling peptide nanoparticles and how we use them for biomedical applications. First, I will explain you how we design those particles, and then I will go into the, the applications. So this here is a small virus. It has icosahedral symmetry. If you look at that, basically you have uh, two-fold, three-fold, and five-fold symmetry elements here. And we were uh, wondering, can we mimic virus-like particles, as you can see here, with just artificial proteins? So our background is basically from uh, protein uh, design. We were working with coiled coils. Here you can see, uh, oh, I can take. So these are the axes of the icosahedron. You see the threefold, the twofold, and the fivefold symmetry axis. And then if you take cold coil proteins like this green helix here, this forms a pentameric coil coil. And the blue helix here, it forms the trimeric coil coil. You align it along the threefold and the fivefold symmetry axis, and you combine them into one single molecule. So that's one single peptide chain. And then you will get something which looks like that. So here you have the trimeric coil coil. Here you have the pentameric coil coil. They are aligned along the uh, symmetry axis of the icosahedron, and then in the self-assembly process, it will generate a nanoparticle which looks like that. It has icosahedral symmetry, and actually, this is nicely visible here. The colors are not exactly matching, but you can see the pentamer here in blue colors and the trimers here in, in yellow-red colors and nicely fitting the icosahedral shape of, uh, of, the, of the particle. Looking at not a computer model, on a computer you can do pretty much anything, but looking in reality, this is an EM uh, picture of such nanoparticles, and you can see they, they really form very nice, homogeneous nanoparticles. So we were thinking about uh, different applications for uh, uh, biomedical applications. Largely, we, we are looking now into vaccine design. And to design a vaccine, we need to address the immune response. So there are three major types of immune response, and all of them we can address with our nanoparticles. The first one is the B-cell immune response. You get a very strong B-cell immune response when you repetitively display something on a nanoparticle surface, and uh, basically, this means something looks like a virus, and a virus is an inf infectious agent. So if something looks like a virus, presumably it should also induce a strong immune response. So we take our nanoparticles. We can easily uh, make a kind of Lego with molecular biology. We can engineer different sizes of the particles depending on, on the size of the, of the protein. So in green, you have the pentamer, in blue, the trimer, and then in red, we stick an epitope from an antigen. See, here, this is malaria epitope, just on top of the uh, protein chain. So it's still only one single protein chain, and just by making the trimer a little bit longer, here you can see the trimer here is a little bit longer than it is here, you just increase the size of the particles. And if you have a particle of this size, it's a very good immunogen. 
So we can use that then as a vaccination toolkit. You can engineer pretty much a vaccine against uh, any disease uh, that you're interested in. The second uh, immune response that is important is the T cell immune response. You can also use the nanoparticles to stimulate the very good T cell immune response. So how do we do that? We engineer T cell epitopes into the core of the particles. So T cell uh, epitopes, it's basically this small sequence here in magenta, that's called Padre, whatever that is, when it binds to uh, MHC class. Two molecule like here, so you see the magenta uh, peptide binds to this uh, MHC, two molecules, that triggers then a very strong T cell immune response. Now how can we engineer an extended peptide into a, a, a coiled coil? Basically, we align the sequence of the, of the peptide, of the T-cell epitope, along with the coil coil sequence, which has a seven-repeat uh, seven uh, pattern in which A and D positions are all, always hydrophobic residues. So if you glide it along that heptad repeat, you might be able to find a, a pattern that uh, allows you to incorporate the T-cell epitope into the core and make it uh, helical. So that's the immune response. On the left side you see without T-cell uh, help, on the right hand side with T-cell help, actually this is an ELISA, and you can see it's a huge improvement of the immune response. The third one of the immune responses that we want to address is the innate immune response. How can you do that? There are some uh, molecules called PAMPs. One of them is flagellin. Flagellin stimulates the innate immune response. This is the flagellin molecule. You can see, since it's a protein, we can simply attach it to the uh, peptide chain forming the particle and then make a co-assembly of a peptide chain that has the B-cell epitope here in red decorated and then incorporate just one flagellin molecule in the particle. It forms beautiful particles. It stimulates the TLR5 receptor quite a, a bit, actually even stronger than a native flagellin itself. So when you engineer uh, flagellin onto our nanoparticles, flagellin is even more potent than it's na in its native form. This is the improvement that we get. We get a 200 times stronger immune response from our particles than from KLH, and KLH is one of the standard uh, vaccine carriers that are, is uh, being used currently. So now to the biomedical applications. One is a universal flu vaccine. So the B cell uh, immune response, we uh, use M2E as a tetramer, helix C as a trimer. Uh, the T cell uh, epitope will be padre, and an innate immune response will be triggered by flagellin. How does it look like? So here we have basically now we have a little bit of a different concept. We combine a trimer with a tetramer helix because M2E is a tetrameric protein. And if we uh, combine it with a tetramer, we can display M2E in its native uh, conformation. Helix C, which is a trimer, we can display on the trimeric coil coil, and then we get the nanoparticle, which looks like that. This has now octane. Uh, octahedral symmetry, and here you see the flagellin molecule that is also incorporated. This is, this is a biophysical analysis. You have the si size as you expect, and this is now a challenge in a mouse model. We uh, use the, the, the peptide nanoparticles here, and we, we can see we have 100% survival after challenge. The, the uh, animals that are not treated, they will all die. We have very good cross-neutralization. I cannot go into all the details, but basically we have a universal influenza vaccine that is, gives 100% protection and that is very easily produced uh, in a bacterial expression system. For our malaria vaccine, we are taking, again, the concept with the pentamer and the trimer. We attach two different B-cell epitopes in the NANP region of uh, CSP, the alpha-TSR region of CSP, and uh, pay attention. Here we have a fully folded protein that is displayed on the particle. And then, of course, the particle looks a little bit more complicated. 
If we engineer flagellin onto it, basically it would look like that. So here we have on average uh, two flagellin molecules that are incorporated. And uh, we are actually now uh, testing this in a clinical uh, trial. That's an ongoing effort. It should be finished in about one year. So we can display B cell epitopes. We can incorporate incorporate T-cell epitopes, CD4 and CD8 epitopes. We can attach completely folded protein domains. We get almost complete comp uh, protection. We have long-term protection. It's very cheap and it's extremely thermostable. So that's exactly what you would uh, look for for a malaria vaccine. For a nicotine vaccine, we actually take a nanoparticle that is 100% flagellin only. Here at the tip, we can couple nicotine, and then if it assembles, the nicotine molecule will be displayed at the surface of the particle. And also for this, we have very good immunogenicity. We have a thousand times stronger immune response than with KLH. It is very well stable. It can be easily produced in large scale. So we are ready to move in, into clinical trials with this prototype as well. So in summary, we can say we have a highly immunogenic, fully protective, broadly neutralizing protein nanoparticle that can be uh, used for various different uh, vaccine application. And as I said, it's very easy to be produced. And with this, I would like to acknowledge the main people working on those projects. It's largely those guys here, and then uh, Sa Sharari and Chris uh, up here. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation, and the paper is open for discussion. Any question? Yes. Well, congratulations for your work. So, what is the distribution of these um, uh, nanoparticles? Once they are injected in, uh, in the animals or whatsoever, so is any biodistribution? Uh, um the biodistribution in a live animal? Yes. It, it largely depends on the, what type of uh, targeting entity we uh, attach to the nanoparticle. So if, if you attach uh, flagellin, flagellin is a receptor for uh, dendritic cells, uh, antigen-presenting cells, so it will largely go to those cells. So wherever those cells are, the, the nanoparticle will be. If we attach a, a targeting entity like a bombazine or so, it will uh, preferen preferentially go to, to the, uh, those target cells, but in general, most of the particles that are not going into a specific tissue will end up in the liver because it's a protein, uh, uh, protein particle. Any other question, comment? Yes. What about the colloidal stability of this, uh, of this object, especially when you have high concentration of uh, protein nanovectors? Uh, can you repeat that? So I would like to know a little bit more about the colloidal stability of uh, this kind of, uh, of systems, because when you have a huge concentration of, ant of antibody, for example, you have an issue of uh, aggregation of antibodies. So I would like just to... That's to a very good question. Of course, again, it largely depends on what we use for coding. If you attach a fully folded protein, usually the particles are very nicely soluble because a protein itself is usually soluble. So if you attach it to the nanoparticle, the nanoparticle will be very soluble as well. So for vaccine applications, we need actually very little amount. So we inject something like 50 micrograms per injection at, at most. So we are not really concerned about that at, at all. If you would think for, uh, of a drug targeting, drug delivery, imaging application, then it's much more of, a, of an issue. And then, yeah, we, we can concentrate it uh, usually up to one milligram per milliliter. But again, it's largely dependent on the, on the particular coding that we have. Any other comment, questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. And uh,